Glutathione declines during aging, and that's what we'll see in three different studies. So on the y-axis, we've got glutathione levels, or GSH, plotted against age. And for each of these studies, we can see the age-related decline. 50% in the first study, 15% in the second study, and 33% in the third study. But then the question is, why does glutathione decline during aging? So glutathione is a tripeptide that's comprised of glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. These are amino acids. And we can see glutathione's chemical structure shown here as it's a tripeptide comprised of glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. Which then raises the question, do levels, levels of these amino acids, glutamate, cysteine, and or glycine, decline during aging as a potential explanation for why glutathione declines during aging? So plasma levels of glycine and cysteine are lower in older adults, and that's what we'll see in results from this study, which included 40-year-olds and 70-year-olds. So when looking at plasma levels of glycine, to start there, in the young subjects, it was 487 micromolar, but only 218 micromolar in the 70-year-olds. Similarly, plasma levels of cysteine were also lower in the 70-year-olds, 26.2 micromolar in the 40-year-olds and about 20 micromolar in the 70-year-olds. But levels of glutamate, plasma levels of glutamate were not different when comparing the 40 with the 70-year-olds. So one study is important, but as a weakness in this study, note that it only included eight subjects per group, and this is a relatively small sample size. So if we're looking for population-based averages, larger studies are the goal, or evidence from larger studies is the goal. So one that I was able to find had a larger sample size. So are plasma levels of these amino acids different with a larger sample size? So here we're looking at plasma levels of glycine, again, in young and older adults. And now the young adult group was an average age, had an average age of 30 years, and now there were 20 of them. So just in the young group, the sample size was already larger than the previous study, which only had 16. But the older adult group, which had an average age of 66 years, there were 120 of them. So we've got a bit of a larger sample size. Ideally, I'd like to see thousands or larger for plasma levels of glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. And if anyone's come across studies that large for population-based averages, please post it in the comments and I'd be happy to give you a shout out in a future video. Once again, using a relatively larger sample size, we can see plasma levels of glycine are indeed lower in the older adults. All right, so what about cysteine? So that's what we're looking at here, total levels of cysteine in blood in the young and older adults. And now we see the opposite is true. In the larger sample size, the study with the larger sample size, plasma levels of cysteine were higher in the older adults when compared with the younger adults. So from these two studies, we can see that plasma glycine is again lower, but cysteine is higher in one study and significantly lower in the other, so inconsistent, inconsistent data. But what about glutamate? Now here too, I wasn't able to find very large studies. So here too, if, you, if anyone's come across those studies, please, please post it in the comments. But when considering that each of these three amino acids is required to make glutathione, if we track and optimize them, can we help keep glutathione relatively high and avoid its age-related decline? So to track levels of these amino acids, I've been using at-home metabolomics, more specifically Iolo's metabolomic kit, which besides these three amino acids contains more than 600 met metabolites, and I've covered many of them on the channel. If you've missed that, I'll, I'll link to the metab metabolomics playlist in the right corner. And if you want to measure levels of these amino acids or many other metabolites, there's a discount link in the video's description. All right, so what's my data? So first, starting with plasma levels of glycine. In 2023, over five tests, average plasma glycine was 283 micromolar. In 2024, over seven tests, it's 518 micromolar. And rather than just looking at two different uh, years based on averages, we can compare them with a two-sample t-test. And when I did that, this is significantly higher, 518 micromolar. That 2024 data, 2024's data is significantly higher with a p-value of 0.02, less than 0.05 being the threshold for significance when compared with 2023 data. All right, what about plasma levels of cysteine? So similar story, 11 micromolar average in 2023 over five tests. 30 micromolar average over seven tests in 2024. And here too, two sample t-tests, significantly higher in 2024 when compared with 2023. What about plasma levels of glutamate? So 2023 average, 129 micromolar over five tests. And in 2024, thus far over seven tests, 214 micromolar. And here too, a significant increase. 
So that then raises the question, have I been supplementing with levels of these amino acids to have higher levels, higher relative levels in 2024 relative to 2023? And I have not. But then the next obvious question could be, what about protein intake? If protein intake is higher in 2024 versus 2023, could that explain the higher levels, plasma levels of these amino acids as proteins are comprised of amino acids? That would seem to be an easy place to look. So I can look at those data because I've been tracking diet every day since 2015, weighing it on a food scale, entering it into chronometer, then putting that data into a spreadsheet. So here we're going to take a look at the average daily protein intake. And note that each dot corresponds to the average daily protein intake that corresponds to that test. Now, it's not the day before the test. For a quick review, for people who may be unfamiliar, if there are 50 days in between tests, because I'm tracking diet every day and weighing all of my food, the average intake for that 50-day period then corresponds with the latter test. Now, every blood test has a corresponding average dietary intake, not just protein intake, but calories and macros and micros and other foods. And then with enough data for blood tests and diet, I can look at correlations. So average daily protein intake that corresponded to each of these tests in 2023 was 98 grams per day. And then a bit higher in 2024. And when using a two-sample t-test, it was just outside of statistical significance, but it's very close to being lower than that less than 0.05 threshold. But is a six gram per day average protein uh, uh, intake increase, is that enough to almost double or in some cases triple looking at plasma levels of cysteine? Plasma levels, I'm not sure. Which then raises the question, are other dietary components significantly associated with relatively higher levels of these amino acids? So now we're going to take a look at 12 test correlations with diet, which includes macro, micronutrients, and foods for glycine, cysteine, and glutamate. And note that the p-value for each of the, on each of these tables is less than 0.05, but in the interest of space, I can't fit them all. And if you want to see the full correlation list, those are on the correlations tier on Patreon. And it doesn't just include correlations for these three amino acids, it includes many other biomarkers too. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Now, note that when I'm looking at uh, all of these correlations with these three amino acids, for each amino acid, there are 86 comparisons, meaning uh, macronutrients, micronutrients, and foods, in total, those are 80, there are 86 of them. And then I looked at correlations for each of these three amino acids. In other words, there were 258 total comparisons. And the reason I raised that point is because when using a p-value less than 0.05, that means that 5 out of 100 could be expected to be false positives. So with 258 different comparisons, I could expect to see around 13 of these significant correlations being false positives and not real correlations, just statistical noise. So one way to account for that is the false discovery rate, and I've used that approach in other videos. I've even published in academic papers using that approach, and I'm a fan of it when using studies when you can't get closer to causation. However, I'm going to use a different approach in this video. And before we go there, just note that the lowercase r is the correlation coefficient. And what that means is if a value is positive in that column, that means that higher levels of the food or nutrient is significantly correlated with higher levels of the amino acid, glycine, cysteine, or glutamate. Conversely, if it's a negative correlation, that means higher intake of the food or nutrient is significantly correlated with lower levels of the amino acid. All right, so what's the approach instead of using the false discovery rate? So I want to know, is there a common theme across all three amino acids? I find it hard to believe that just picking three amino acids that, you know, I've got this basically all of them increasing by a relatively similar amount. And it doesn't seem obvious that a six gram per day increase in protein intake would close to double their levels. So I want to see first if there's a common theme across all three of these amino acids. So we can see that oranges, iron intake, and fiber are significantly correlated with glycine, cysteine, and glutamate. And in other words, you can see I've coded them green, which means that higher levels are so significantly correlated with higher levels of these amino acids. On the other, on the other side, on the other hand, higher levels of sodium, oats, barley, low-fat yogurt, and Parmesan cheese are significantly correlated with lower levels of these amino acids. But also note that calories make the list. So, and these are negative correlations for all three amino acids. In other words, a relatively higher calorie intake is significantly correlated with lower levels of glycine, cysteine, and glutamate, which then raises the question, are the overlapping 
uh, significant, significantly overlapping correlations. So the reds and greens, the eight overlapping uh, correlations for each of these amino acids. Are they still significant after accounting for protein intake, which seems like an obvious factor that we should account for, and calorie intake? Or are protein intake and calorie intake driving most of the association for higher levels of these three amino acids in 2024 versus 2023? So a first question to ask, just as an illustrative example, we'll use fiber. So is fiber intake significantly associated with plasma levels of glycine after adjusting for protein and calorie intake? And to figure that out, I built a linear regression model, which sounds a lot more fancy than it is. It's not that it's not that complicated. And this is the combined association for glycine versus calorie intake, protein intake, and fiber intake. So in other words, after adjusting now for calories and protein intake, fiber intake is still significantly positively associated with glycine. And you can see that the coefficient is positive, the p-value is less than 0.05, and the significance f which is a measure of the sig significance of the collective model. Now we're looking at the combined association for calories, protein, and fiber against glycine is also less than 0.05, so it's a significant model. So these data suggest that after accounting for calorie and protein intake, a relatively higher fiber intake is significantly associated with higher levels of glycine. So fiber may also be a part of the relatively higher levels of amino acid story. But remember, I want to look at overlapping associations not for just glycine, but the other amino acids. So what's that story? In other words, is fiber intake and the other overlapping associations significantly associated with plasma glutamate and, and cysteine after adjusting for protein intake? So now we're going to put up another column, the calorie and protein adjusted p-value for each of these three amino acids. And I want to know if those eight overlapping foods or nutrients across each of these three amino acids is still significant after adjusting linear regression models for calorie and protein intake. So first, starting with fiber, we just saw that fiber was still significantly associated with glycine after adjusting for calorie and protein intake. And it's also significantly associated with cysteine under those same conditions and glutamate. So then what do I do with this information? Because it seems like fiber a relatively higher fiber intake may be a part of the story for keeping rel uh, these levels of these amino acids relatively high, which I want to do because I want to try to keep glutathione levels also relatively high. So my fiber intake range over these 12 tests is 83 to 89 grams per day. To follow the correlation, knowing that higher may be better for these three amino acids, I should aim for the higher end of my intake range over these 12 tests, which is 89 grams per day. So I've coded that in green. In contrast, if I was aiming for the lower end of my range, that wouldn't follow a correlation. And the prediction would be that if correlation implies causation, and again, I don't know, I'd have to do the experiment. If I cut protein intake to the lower end of the range, I'd expect to see lower levels, plasma levels of these amino acids. All right, so what about the other overlapping associations? How do they fit into this story? So when looking at oranges, iron, vanilla beans, or sorry, that should be barley, uh, vanilla beans and barley, and Parmesan cheese, none of those were significantly associated after accounting for protein and calorie intake with glycine. So I'm not going to look at the overlapping associations as I want to look for the common theme across all three amino acids, associations for all three amino acids. Iron, still significantly associated with glycine, still significantly associated with cysteine, and glutamate. All right, so here too, what do I do with that information? The iron intake range over those 12 tests is 30 to 34 milligrams per day. So to follow the correlation, I should aim for 34 milligrams per day to try to keep levels of these plasma levels of these amino acids relatively high. Again, assuming correlation equals a causation, I don't know if that's true. All I can do is follow the correlations. All right, and then the last overlapping association was oats. So still associated with glycine, still associated with cysteine, but after adjusting for calorie and protein intake is not significantly associated with glutamate. Now, these data then raise another question. Uh, if I'm going to keep fiber and iron relatively high while accounting for protein and uh, calorie and protein intake to help to try to help keep levels of these plasma, plasma levels of, of these amino acids high, that's a reductionist approach. I'm basically forgetting about all other biomarkers. And I don't want to just improve or increase levels of these three amino acids to help keep glutathione high. I'm, I'm focused on net effects. What's the net effect of a higher fiber and higher iron intake on a multitude of biomarkers, biomarkers that represent many organ, system, organ systems right, and, and metabolic health, right? So uh, the goal isn't to just 
optimize a few and forget about the others. The goal is to optimize as many as possible. So how are higher levels of fiber and iron associated with other biomarkers? And I won't go into that story in this video. If you're interested in that, those data are on the correlations tier on Patreon. So check it out. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more of my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you, before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself or products that you can use while helping to support the channel, including ultalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests, clearly filtered water filter, epigenetic testing, including Dunedin Pace, oral microbiome composition, NAD with Ginfinity, at-home metabolomics, as I covered in the video, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also the DNA methylation test Grimage, green tea, dye tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.